Hey friends, welcome to the Cherry Hills Church Podcast. We're in a teaching series on God's Spirit, learning together how the Holy Spirit empowers us to know and live the way of Jesus. Thanks for going on this journey together with us. It was either uh, last summer or the summer before that, but this show was the number one stream show in the United States. Now, I don't know what that says about us as a country. Uh, Maybe that's a different message someday, but essentially this show is people make these cakes and contestants have to guess whether they're actually real or they're a cake. Here are a couple examples of that, right? Which one is the real one? Which one is the cake? Here's another example of that. I mean, that's crazy, right, if that's a cake. I I don't know which is which. And the the reason I want to share this with you today is we continue our series studying the Holy Spirit Uh, I want to talk to you today about how we can know whether or not we are truly filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because it is possible for us, friends, to fake it, to not really be real. But the reality is Jesus himself said that true disciples of his will see evidences of the Holy Spirit and whether or not their faith is real. Now, Brian already mentioned this. In case you missed it, last week we started this series. Jeff kicked off the series with a little overview, both of who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does. And I I just sum up some of these things. He reminded us, right, that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is not an it or a force out there. The Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. In fact, sometimes referred to as the Spirit of Jesus. We know the Holy Spirit is our helper, And here's the best part is the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus' Spirit lives in every true born-again believer. Now, for the next five weeks, we're going to sort of unpack what exactly it is that the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. And if you're following, to put it as simply as I can, this is the sentence we are using for this series. The Holy Spirit empowers us to know and live the way of Jesus. This, more than anything else, is my biggest hope for you that you take away from this series. The Holy Spirit's job in my life, the Holy Spirit's job in your life, is to help you live the Christian life. The theological word for this is sanctification. Have you ever heard that word, right? Sanctification is just the process that we go through over time as we grow, as we mature more into the likeness of who Jesus is. And that happens not by our own power, but by the beautiful gift that Jesus gave us by indwelling his spirit within us. His primary job is to help us become more and more transformed into the person of Jesus. I like what Francis Chan said about this in his great book, Forgotten God, which we have available at the Resource Center. He says, if it's true that the Spirit of God dwells in us and that our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple, then shouldn't there be a huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living inside of him or her and the person who does not? In other words, is it real or is it cake, right? Or if you're following There will be evidences that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. And today I'm just going to unpack some of those evidence that will be a part of our lives if we have the Holy Spirit. So if you haven't already, let me invite you to take a Bible. If you brought one with you, your device, turn it to Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19. If you don't have a Bible, again, we say this every week, we have Bibles available for you in the seats underneath you there somewhere, those black Bibles, and you can find this on page 946 of those Bibles, and feel free to take one of those Bibles home with you today. If you don't own a Bible, we love giving those Bibles away. Now, here's the deal I'm going to make with you. You're going to have to keep that open for a little bit. We're going to come to that passage later on in the service. I want to touch on some of the other uh, some of the other evidences before we get into that main text right there. In fact, I actually want to start with something that has caused a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit. There are some who teach, some Christians who teach that the primary evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in your life is that you will speak in tongues. How many of you have heard of speaking in tongues before, right? You don't really have the full measure of the Holy Spirit, or you're not a real upper-class Christian, so to speak, unless you are able to speak in tongues. Now, let me just define this idea of speaking in tongues. It is a biblical concept, and here's what it is. Here's the definition. According to the Bible, speaking in tongues is the spiritual ability to speak forth a message from God or to God 
in divinely anointed utterances. Now that may be as clear as mud, so let me simplify that. Tongues is simply the ability to speak in another language. It could be a heavenly language, sometimes referred to in the Bible as a prayer language, or it could be another language that allows somebody else to understand what you are saying. The first time this happens, some of you are familiar with this, right? Jesus ascends into heaven. Remember, he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit, and sure enough, the disciples are gathered together in an upper room praying the Holy Spirit comes in fire. They go out into the streets, and they start preaching the good news of Jesus, and here's the key, in languages that they didn't even know. But people in the streets could understand them. That was the gift that the Holy Spirit gave them. And sadly, some churches teach that that is still the primary evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life. They refer to this as the second baptism or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You may have been baptized in Jesus, but have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet? Have you heard of this before? I worked at a church when I was in seminary that this is what they taught. In fact, every year they would have this retreat for the youth who would go off to a camp, and the whole goal of the camp was that they would come back being able to speak in tongues, that they would you know, have the second experience of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to imagine what happens when some of those kids come back and they are not able to speak in tongues. What, what does that create? It creates division. It creates classes of Christians. And friends, we know for a fact that Jesus' primary hope, his prayer for his church in John 17 before he ascends, in, ascends into heaven is what? Unity and oneness. And I will say to you, I don't think there's much else that has divided the church of Jesus Christ than this teaching of speaking in tongues that it is the primary evidence in a believer's life that you have the Holy Spirit. Luke is gonna talk a little bit more about this in a few weeks when we get into the gifts of the Spirit, but let me just say two quick things about speaking in tongues. Number one, we at Cherry Hills believe speaking in tongues is still a spiritual gift that is active in the lives of people today. I'm saying this because there are some churches that teach that once we got the Bible, once it was canonized, once we had it in its full, you know, in its full manuscripts, all the like miraculous gifts sort of stopped at that moment. No more miracles, no more healing, no more speaking in tongues. We don't believe that here at Cherry Hills. We believe God still uses these gifts. In fact, I've experienced this gift before. But number two, let me just say, we don't believe every person will have this gift. We don't believe it is the primary evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in your life. In fact, just, in, just let me take a quick verse here from 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit. Again, I'm not going to get too much into this, but the end of this chapter, which Luke is going to look at with us, like I said, in a few weeks, I want you to just look at what Paul writes. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers... Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? What is the answer he is looking for there? These are rhetorical questions, and the answer is no. Not everybody is going to have the gift of teaching, nor is everybody going to have the gift of speaking in tongues. Paul says, pray for this gift. Yearn for this gift, but it is not the primary evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in your life. The primary evidence that you have the Holy Spirit in your life is that you came to Christ. Because the moment you came to Christ, you were given the Holy Spirit of God. We good? All right, are we ready to move on? Then what I would simply refer to as the biblical evidences that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. I hope you are. Here's how we can know for sure that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. The first evidence of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit helps us grow in our understanding of the truth. Look at John 16, 13 through 14 with me. In fact, can we read the first part of verse 13 together on our notes there? It says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The rest goes on to say, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears from who? 
from Jesus, from the Father, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me. This is his primary work, bringing glory to Jesus by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. One of the most important roles of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that he will lead us into truth. By truth, Jesus means the truth about who he is, about his identity, the truth about who you are now in Christ if you've received him as Lord and Savior, the truth about Jesus' teachings. He helps us understand what Jesus was teaching, which are recorded where? In the Bible, in the very words of God that God has given us to learn from. It is the Holy Spirit who makes those words in Scripture come alive. Have you ever had that experience? Perhaps you've been here on a Sunday morning and one of us is teaching. I've had this happen multiple times and people come to me and say, why were you looking at me that whole message? And I say, I wasn't looking at you. What's going on there? That's the Holy Spirit at work in your life, helping you grow in truth. Or maybe you're reading a chapter of the Bible and there's this verse that just sort of pops off the pages and you're like, whoa, I've never noticed that before. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life because the Holy Spirit wants to help us understand and grow in truth. Why? Well, did you know the number one warning in all of the New Testament is against false teaching? Be on guard. Be careful against different false teachings, false doctrines. In six of the seven letters that Jesus writes to the churches of Revelation, he warns them of false teaching. In seriously, every letter that Paul writes in the New Testament, he's writing to contradict some sort of false teaching. And yet today, I think we live in an age, or at least a culture, where we're more excited about experiences with God than we are about the truth of God. Doctrine is still hugely important. But today, we hear in our culture, our society, right, forget about truth. There's no truth with a capital T. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth. And yet Jesus comes along and he says very clearly, my word is true. And it is the Holy Spirit of Jesus who helps us come to a deeper appreciation, love, knowledge of that truth. And so what this means for us as believers is the best thing, one of the best things we can do is immerse ourselves in God's word. And while we do that, either whether that's here together on Sunday morning or you're at home, you're reading the Bible, here's what I would encourage you to do. Pray every time you open up his word, Holy Spirit, help me to grow in my understanding of your truth my understanding of who you are and who I am as a follower of yours. Second evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in the believer's life is that the Holy Spirit provides comfort and peace even in trials. Let's look at John 14, 16 through 18 on the screen. He says, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, Jeff talked about this last week, this beautiful word counselor in the Greek, which literally means to come alongside of you. I mean, I just want you to think about this, right? If you know someone in your life right now who is discouraged, the best way that you could encourage them is to come alongside of them to put your arm around them, right? And this is what the Holy Spirit does to us. He comes alongside of us, even in our hardest times. Have you experienced this? I've been in a lot of hospice rooms, which is where people, you know, they're at the end of their life. They know that death is imminent. And I can tell you, I'll put my hand on the Bible, even though we're not supposed to do that, right? There is a difference between somebody who has the Holy Spirit alongside of them in those moments and someone who does not. The Holy Spirit provides us comfort and peace even in the midst of some of the darkest trials of our lives. I once heard it put this way. I don't know who said this quote, but I like it enough to share with you. Enemies stand in front of us. They confront us. Critics stand behind us, kind of whispering in our ears. But the Holy Spirit comes alongside us to encourage us and comfort us. 
I love that. You see, here's the deal. Jesus never promised that if we follow him, we won't face trials. We face trials. In fact, he says in John 15 that if we choose to follow him, there will be times when the world actually hates us. But what he does promise is that even in those times, his Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of God, will come alongside you and minister to you. In fact, I want to just share with you one of those truth epiphanies I had this year, thanks to the Holy Spirit. I was reading through uh, Philippians, and I got to chapter 4. Some of you love Philippians 4, 6 through 7, right? It's one of the more famous verses in Scripture. It says this, I have this memorized. This is such an important verse for me. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then what does it say? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Listen, I've read that dozens and dozens of times. Like I said, I've memorized that, right? Because I experience anxiety and worry at times in my life. But here's what happened a couple months ago. I was reading that verse, and there was this little phrase uh, that stood out to me. And before I share the phrase, let me just explain something to you. You know, when the Bible was written, there weren't actually such things as chapters and verses, right? These were letters written to the church to be read as a full letter. Somebody added the verses later. So it's not like Paul was going, okay, chapter 4, verse 6, right? He wrote a letter. And I want you just to see real quick what he says before verse 6 in verse five. Let your gentleness be evident to all, and then here was the phrase that popped out to me. The Lord is near. And I had one of those Holy Spirit truth epiphanies, like that should actually be the beginning of verse six, in my opinion. Because the reason we don't have to be anxious about anything isn't because of my own mustard prayer, it's because the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about it. The Holy Spirit is in you and with you and comes alongside of you. You don't need to be anxious about anything for I'm right here. No matter what I'm facing, I am near. I have the helper right next to me. Have you experienced that sort of comfort, that peace that passes all understanding in your life? Even when the floodwaters are rising? I've shared before, but the first time I was ever asked to speak in front of a crowd, I was begging my youth pastor not to do it. I was throwing up in the bathroom, pleading, please do not make me stand out there in front of these other students. And they took me out of the bathroom stall. They laid their hands on me. They prayed for the peace of God to come over me. And I don't know how else to explain it other than it was a supernatural experience. All the anxiety left. Not all of it. (laughs) But enough of it where God gave me the strength that I needed to face my fear in that moment. Have you had moments like that in your life where the Holy Spirit has evidenced himself in you by giving you peace that you simply don't know where it came from? That is one of the evidences of the Spirit. A third evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, according to Jesus, is that the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. Would you read John 16, 8 on your notes out loud with me there? Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. How many of you like the word convict? (laughs) Yeah, I hated it. You know, I used to see this word in the Bible all the time and, and think of it as a similar word to condemn, condemnation, conviction, but I've come around and I now believe this is one of the greatest Bibles that, or, or, words that we have in Scripture. One of the greatest promises that we have been given. You see, the word convict simply means to persuade, to convince, to draw attention to. And that, friends, is the complete opposite of condemnation. Satan, our enemy, loves condemnation because condemnation leads to things like fear and guilt and shame. Any of you experience those like I do? Conviction is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to us that leads to love and understanding and ultimately to repentance. And we know from what Paul writes that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. To put this another way, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to draw my attention 
to the sin in my life that is keeping me from becoming more and more like Jesus. He's like, hey, notice this, not out of fear or shame or guilt, but I want you to notice this, and I want you to turn from that because you know that's not the best path leading you down there. Let me put it this way. A few weeks ago, I was at this busy street, and I watched this little kid run right out into the middle of this street. And the dad, thankfully, you know, caught him, grabbed him by the arm, got down, and was like, listen, buddy, did he condemn him? He said, listen, buddy, when you run out on that street, it's very dangerous. You need to hold my hand. You need to stay close to me when we're in a busy area like this and so on and so forth. Now, does that feel condemning to you? No, it's, it's a conviction. It's a pleading. It's a helping that kid understand. You can't go across this busy street or you'll get in trouble. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit's like, listen, buddy, you're going down a path right now that's going to lead you places you don't want to go. The cool thing about this is it was this conviction that led you to Jesus in the first place. None of us are here without the conviction of the Spirit. I mean, we like to believe today that we chose to follow Jesus, but the truth is, before you ever made a decision to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit was at work in your life saying, you need a Savior. You can't do this on your own. There is sin in your life. It's the Holy Spirit that leads every one of us to pray, right? I am a sinner in need of grace. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit continues in our lives through the sanctification process. Does this happen to you regularly or is it just me? It's like every day. Steve, you missed it here. Steve, you're walking down the wrong path. I'll just give you an example from this week. I was at the transplant games in Birmingham. I was competing in the games. Some of you might know I had a kidney transplant, so they have like a little Olympics uh, for those of us who have done that. And I'm competing in the cycling event. And the whole time, these guys are all following me. It's called drafting, right, on this whole event. And I am getting ticked, right? Stop drafting off me. I've never been in a race where you're allowed to do that. I'm like actually yelling at them. You take the lead, right? And at the end of it, this guy comes up to me and he's like, man, you worked, they passed me at the end, right? Like, so annoying. (laughs) And the guy comes up to me and is like, dude, thanks for pulling us, that was awesome. I'm like, no. (laughs) And I didn't even like give him a fist bump. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit said, swallow your pride, you idiot. Go congratulate him. And I can tell you, without the Holy Spirit, that doesn't happen. Right? That's not me. That doesn't happen in my flesh. But I did it. Now, there are many times when I don't do it, when I don't listen to the Holy Spirit's conviction in my life, but I tend to believe that he really wants the best for us. And when he convicts us, it's for a good reason. Now, the truth is, we don't always have to listen to the Holy Spirit's conviction. I could have ignored that. I often do ignore it. But here's the danger. Over time, if we keep ignoring the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we will no longer hear his voice. And that's a very dangerous place to be. Because number four, if you're following, the fourth evidence of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit's job, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of godly character. It's his primary job, right, to be, help us to become more like Jesus in our character and conduct. And he does this by producing fruit in our lives. What kind of fruit? Well, if you still got your Bible open, I told you we would get here eventually to Galatians 5. This is the passage we're going to be looking at together. In fact, I'm going to pick it up in verse 19. Before we do, just a little context. Galatians is a letter Paul wrote once again to dispute some false teaching, false doctrine. This church was believing that they had to add circumcision to their faith in Jesus in order to be saved. And Paul reminds them, absolutely not. It's Jesus plus nothing. There is no work that we add to the work that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And then like he does in every one of his letters, he makes this shift to what that now means for the way we live. 
And what he tells this church is like, listen, that doesn't mean now, just because you've been saved by grace alone, that you should live however you want. Don't go back to your old ways of life. In fact, he says this in Galatians 5.1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He's talking specifically like, don't go back into that old lifestyle of sin. And then he picks this idea up in verse 19, which says, the acts of the flesh or the old way of life are obvious, right? Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Basically, Paul is saying, listen, it is going to be obvious when you're walking in step with the Holy Spirit or when you're walking in your flesh. It's going to be obvious based on your character and your attitudes and your actions. I'm telling you, you don't want to go back to that way of life. Now, one of the things I want to mention here, because this has been a hiccup for me at times, is when Paul says, listen, those who live like this, How many of you have ever lived like that? I have. I've done some of those things, right? Does this mean that if you were ever jealous in your life before, you will not inherit the kingdom of God? Or if you ever got drunk before, you will not inherit the kingdom of God? In Greek, this is called a present participle, which is an ongoing action. So what Paul is saying is if this becomes an ongoing action in your life and you don't have any conviction about it at all, you probably do not have the Holy Spirit working in your life. That, that's the warning here. In fact, Paul writes in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we know Jesus, we will be convicted by our sin and we will not be able to go back to our old way of life. I mean, have you ever experienced that? No, 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 no. That's part of his job. Indeed, here's what's gonna happen when we learn to walk in the Holy Spirit, to listen to his voice. Would you read verses 22 and 23 out loud on your notes there with me? Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, often in churches, when we read that, people talk about the fruits of the Spirit because there are nine things listed here. But if you look at Galatians 5, he doesn't say fruits. Paul says fruit, and there's a reason for this. He's not listing nine character qualities that we're supposed to exhaust ourselves in order to try to be. Have you tried that? It's exhausting. I'm going to be more patient today. No, you're not. No, you're not. You, you, you just can't do that in your flesh. I call that flesh fruits, right? He calls them the fruit of the Spirit because they are the natural results of what happens when we are walking in step with the Spirit of God. I know I preach a lot about this, but let me just say this one more time. Right here, we have, again, the difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus. Religion says, I'm gonna be more patient today if it kills me. A relationship with Jesus says, I'm going to walk with the Spirit. I'm going to be with Jesus, and he will produce things in my life that I simply cannot do on my own. This stuff here is supernatural. Amen? I mean, you can't do this. I can't do this. I can't become more loving just by trying. It's supernatural. It's God's work in my life. If you're following on your notes, we cannot produce spiritual fruit in our own life power. I've had many people ask, why don't you guys ever do a series on the fruit of the Spirit? Because of this. Because what's going to happen is we'll take a week and talk about love, and you'll go out and go, I got to be more loving. I got to be more patient. I got to be more gentle. It's not the point. You can't do those things. I can't do those things. We cannot develop this kind of fruit in our own power. It is not through Christian activities through being a good person, that we become like this. Listen, the Pharisees did all these things. They did all these things. Jesus said they were the least fruitful of anyone. 
The way these fruit are developed in our lives is by walking in step with the Spirit. And how do we do that? Here we go. If you're on your notes, the only way to produce spiritual fruit is by abiding in Jesus. Walking with Jesus. Following Jesus. Now, abiding is not a word we use as much today, but it's such a beautiful word, and it's vitally important if we want to develop the kind of fruit that God has in store and in mind for us. Jesus talks about it this way in John 15, 5. Again, this is on your notes. Would you read it with me? He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Do you believe that? Religion says, oh, I can do all kinds of stuff. And Jesus says, no, you can't. Unless you're connected to me. You can't bear fruit unless you're connected to Jesus. He is the one who causes these character qualities to grow in our lives. There's no other way. I'll give you an example. A few months ago, I saw a dead plant in one of my coworkers' offices. I won't name names. <laughs> and I said, hey, can I take that plant and try to revive it? And so I brought this plant to my office, and I looked at it, and I said, grow fruit. <laughs> it didn't work. Instead, what I did is I, I began to water it. I began to put it in sunlight. And guess what happened? It grew. It was nourished with the things that it needed to be nourished with, and it became the plant that it was intended to be to become. I've given it since back, and I'm a little worried about it again. <laughs> but friends, that's the same way that growth happens in our lives. You can't expect to bear fruit unless you're connected to Jesus. You can't expect to bear fruit unless you're connected to Jesus. And abide in him. And the way we abide, if you're following, we abide in Jesus by following his example. Live how Jesus lived. Do what Jesus did. Practice what Jesus practiced. What, what does this mean? Well, I've already given you one idea, right? Part of what that means is you spend time in God's word like Jesus did. Jesus had the entire Old Testament memorized. He loved God's word. He knew God's word. If we want to produce fruit, be in God's word. But we abide in Jesus by practicing similar things that he did to abide in his father. His whole earthly ministry, right? He practiced things like prayer and solitude and, and fasting. Jesus served others. He experienced fellowship with people. He practiced God's presence in his everyday life. He cared for people, especially the least of these. He shared the gospel, the good news of the kingdom with his friends. Friends, as we start doing those things, not out of a reason to earn, but simply because we want to follow the way of Jesus, that is when fruit will start to grow. So I'm just going to put it as simple as I can. Your job is not to produce fruit. Your job is to be with Jesus. That's why I won't do a series on the fruit of the Spirit. Because every message will be, you want to become more loving? Spend time with Jesus. You want to be more patient? Spend time with Jesus. You want to be more faithful? Spend time with Jesus. Now, I wish, just like the plant that I took from that person, we would mature immediately. Like we would produce this fruit right away. And I have seen instances of that, right? I've known people who were alcoholics the moment they came to Christ. He took that desire away from them. But the truth is, just like growing fruit, us maturing and growing into Jesus' followers is gonna take time. It's why it's called a spiritual journey. But I wonder if some of you can look back to earlier in your life and you go, oh, not as fast as I wish, but I am more patient. I do see people differently than I used to see them. I, I can see that. I'm still disappointed. I'm not quite where I want to be, but Jesus, your spirit has produced fruit in my life. This is why we're on a journey. And so friends, as we close today, we're going to get ready to take communion. 
And here's the question I want us to consider today to give space for the Spirit to speak to us. After all, it's the Spirit who makes God's Word come alive. If you're following, is there any evidence that the Holy Spirit is actively working in my life? I'm not asking you to feel a measure of condemnation right now, but I am asking you to examine yourselves. That's what Paul tells us we are to do every time we take the Lord's Supper together. Examine yourselves. So I'm just going to invite us into a space to pray, Lord, am I growing in your truth? Am I experiencing comfort and peace in this trial right now? Is there a sin that you're trying to convict me of that I need to turn from? Am I becoming more like you? If not, friends, this is a time to be honest before God, to pray for a greater desire. That's the best prayer you can pray. Give me a desire to become more like you. And so as you take some time to pray, here is a prayer we can pray. I would encourage you to do this every morning. Holy Spirit, help me to become more like Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who is active and present even right now, coming alongside of us. He is not behind us whispering condemnation or in front of us blocking our path to a more joyful life. He is beside us now. And so we open up some space right now for you to speak, to help us to grow, to mature, to see things that you want us to see and help us to respond to this time, to these moments. Thank you for listening to this week's teaching. If you'd like more info on our church, you can visit our website or find us on Facebook.